glittering over Times Square, the best-known trademark in all the world suggests one thing to the millions who pass each day. The pause that refreshes with ice-cold Coca-Cola. Wherever people go, in large cities or small, to countries in the distant corners of the world, or right down the main street of their own hometown, this is the trademark they know better than any other. This is the familiar invitation to the enjoyment of America's favorite beverage. And every day, millions of people in every walk of life accept that invitation. Now, what is the story behind this popularity? How did it come about? What was the origin of Coca-Cola? Let's turn back the calendar and start at the very beginning. Back we go to the gay 90s, the days of the horse and buggy and the bicycle built for two, when hustle and bustle was mostly bustle, and streetcars stopped and started with whoa and did up. Our story begins in the thriving little city of Atlanta, Georgia. Here is the setting, an unpretentious old residence about three blocks from the center of town. And here is the kitchen where a patient experimenter worked to produce a delicious and refreshing drink. A drink that would be the perfect answer to thirst. His preparations were made in a kettle, measured with a ladle, and stirred with a paddle. And after years of experimenting, he perfected in 1886 a drink destined to be known and enjoyed the world over. The name of the experimenter was Dr. J.S. Pemberton. And the trademark for the drink was suggested by F. M. Robinson, one of Dr. Pemberton's closest friends. He invented the trademark Coca-Cola, now one of the most famous in the world. C-O-C-A-C-O-L-A, Coca-Cola. Yet that trademark, which means so much to so many today, didn't mean anything in 1886. What do you think was the sales total in that year? Just 25 gallons of syrup. And the advertising appropriation? The stupendous sum of $46. But the selling value of advertising was recognized even this early, and the seed was sown for later development. In 1888, Coca-Cola came under the control of Asa G. Candler, a man with vision, with foresight, a man who saw the opportunities in Coca-Cola. Under his leadership, the company soon began to grow. In 1898, just 10 years later, sales reached 200,000 gallons, and Mr. Candler built this new factory, a building every bit of three stories high. In his annual report to his associates, Mr. Candler said, Gentlemen, we have moved into our new factory. We don't know what to do with ourselves on the count of the room, but let us thank God we have had vision enough to build for all time. Yes, Mr. Candler thought they had built for all time. Even he could not foresee a development that was to give the business its greatest impetus. Up to this time, Coca-Cola had been available only at the soda fountain, but people wanted Coca-Cola everywhere they went. So they developed another way to distribute Coca-Cola that offered tremendous possibilities. And that was the bottle. The early bottle was a crude affair. Instead of being capped with a crown, bottles were sealed with an old rubber wire stopper. To open the bottle, you had to strike the wire with the palm of your hand. This made a resounding pop. And that's where people first got the name, pop. Probably the best known of the pioneer bottlers of Coca-Cola during those early days was Mr. Joseph Biedenharn of Vicksburg, Mississippi, affectionately known to everyone as Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe was a trailblazer in the bottling industry. But the first widespread progress in the bottling of Coca-Cola came about through three men, B.F. Thomas, Joseph Whitehead, and a little later, J.T. Lupton, all of Chattanooga, Tennessee. The story goes that Mr. Thomas and Mr. Whitehead got the idea of bottling Coca-Cola at a ball game where all afternoon they had to do without their favorite refreshment. If only Coca-Cola could be distributed in bottles, they reasoned, 
Think how many more places it might be sold besides the fountain. And here was the final result of the idea. A contract from Mr. Candler giving them the right to bottle and sell Coca-Cola. The idea took hold. During the first years of the 1900s, bottling plants sprang up everywhere. Machines were operated by foot power. This was the only equipment known at that time. And deliveries were made by horse and wagon. But the old gray mare inevitably gave way to the gasoline buggy. And the rapid development of the automobile added impetus to the growth of Coca-Cola. It made possible ever-increasing distribution. In 1915, a standard bottle was adopted. This distinctive bottle, used only for Coca-Cola, is now familiar to people everywhere. And so we come to the present. Now, what has happened to Coca-Cola over the period of years from 1886 to the present? More than half a century. From the kettle and ladle in the little house on Marietta Street, Coca-Cola has grown so that it now includes eight modern factories in the United States and six in foreign countries, supplying syrup to over a thousand plants like yours, where Coca-Cola is bottled. And they in turn sell to over a million retailers who supply it to millions of people seeking refreshment, not only in the United States, but everywhere. Yes, today Coca-Cola is everywhere. In Canada, where the thermometer hits 40 below, Coca-Cola is delivered on sleds when the trucks can go no farther through the snowbanks. In the bull rings of Spain, you'll find the spectators enjoying ice-cold Coca-Cola. France, a cafe in Paris. Notice in the background the famous Notre Dame Cathedral. England, Big Ben, the House of Parliament, and Coca-Cola. Denmark, drink Coca-Cola, summer or winter. Norway, the port of Oslo. Italy, a cafe overlooking the Bay of Naples and the Isle of Capri. Switzerland, the pause that refreshes in the shadow of the great Matterhorn, one of the world's highest mountains. The Philippine Islands, a little street in Singapore, a coffee shop in Hong Kong. The sun never sets on Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is everywhere because thirst and the need for refreshment are everywhere. Now, Coca-Cola could not have enjoyed such widespread popularity over a period of more than half a century without two things. First, the intrinsic goodness of the product itself, the quality of every single ingredient that goes into it. Second, care in preparation. Purity and wholesomeness are safeguarded at every step from the time the raw materials come in to the time when the customer enjoys the finished product. For over half a century, Coca-Cola has complied with the pure food laws of the United States and foreign countries. Everything that goes into that bottle of Coca-Cola is a pure product of nature. Good things from nine sunny climes, products of nature, blended before man learned to reproduce flavors and colors by artificial means. And once that bottle is sealed, the beverage becomes a single unit. When that crown goes on the bottle, it's ready to leave the plant what the Supreme Court of the United States has pronounced it. A single thing coming from a single source and well known to the community. It is Coca-Cola, a finished drink, a drink pure as sunlight and called for by millions of people every day. But here is something else. Coca-Cola owes its goodness and popularity not only to the purity and wholesomeness of its content, but also to the painstaking care and accuracy shown in preparing and blending these products of nature to protect that purity and wholesomeness. In each of 14 spotless factories, the purity of Coca-Cola is safeguarded by scientific tests covering every step in its preparation. Each factory is a modern pure food institution. After testing, the ingredients go to this room where they are carefully weighed, measured, and blended. Only glass and stainless steel utensils are used. 
No ingredient is touched by human hands. In these stainless steel containers, the pure granulated sugar is dissolved to form the simple syrup, which is the base for Coca-Cola. In these tremendous tanks, holding over 5,000 gallons, the flavors finally meet the simple syrup. These products of nature are agitated by electrically driven machinery. Then the syrup is packaged in barrels. But before the barrels leave the factory, a sample from each tank is taken again to the laboratory for a final test. Now the barrels are rolled into freight cars and started on their way to bottling plants all over the United States. There they go, feeding over the rails to satisfy the thirst that knows no season. And here is the destination of those barrels of syrup, the local bottling plant. For although the syrup is shipped from factories elsewhere, Coca-Cola is bottled and sold locally. All right, now let's step inside. We followed the raw materials and the making of the syrup. Now let's see how the bottling is done. Here's the manager of this plant. He is going to explain to us the various bottling steps. Yes, I'll be glad to show you through the plant. First of all, everything in this plant must be clean and sanitary. That's rule number one. Water, for example. The water that we use to combine with the syrup. Most people take water pretty much for granted. But every drop of water that goes into Coca-Cola in our plant has to be purified. Actually, the water we use is purer than the water people drink in their own homes. We take that same drinking water and put it through a purification process. The water goes through special beds of sand and gravel to clean it and through charcoal to purify it. You won't remember all the mechanics, but the important thing is that we take out all the odor, taste, and foreign matter sometimes found in city drinking water. Then, the bottles we use. This sterilizing machine sees to it that every bottle gets a thorough scrubbing, as thorough as it's possible to give. This man puts the bottles into the machine. And inside this soaker, as we call it, every bottle gets a powerful shower bath and stays in there for 35 minutes. All this time, they're being sterilized in a hot solution of caustic soda. Then the same machine sees that the bottles are thoroughly brushed and rinsed with clear, pure water. Here they come now, all sparkling and clean, ready to be filled. They come down on a moving belt to this machine, which adds the syrup. Every bottle gets exactly the same amount. Next, into the bottle goes an exact measured amount of carbonated water, measured according to a formula that cannot be changed. Now the bottles are crowned, sealing the Coca-Cola inside, airtight. And then the syrup and carbonated water are thoroughly mixed. And here they are, each bottle filled and sealed and the contents mixed, untouched by human hands. Now these men put the bottles into cases, pack the cases on the truck, and there goes the truck, taking Coca-Cola to the places where it is sold. Yes, there they go, hundreds of pure, wholesome bottles of Coca-Cola, straight to the retail outlets in the community. Refreshment on the move, refreshment for the thirsty everywhere. So wherever you see this trademark, fellas, think of what's behind it. Purity, protection, a product of flavors perfectly blended. This trademark is a safeguard, assurance that people get what they ask for. In this day and age, people work hard, think hard, play hard. They need the frequent pause that refreshes, a stop in the day to get a new start. A little minute that is long enough for a big rest. Coca-Cola fills that need for refreshment day in and day out. And its millions of friends never tire of it, summer or winter. That's what Coca-Cola is. That's the product which will be on the trucks in the morning. On this case of Coca-Cola depends your living, your livelihood. On this product... You are building your share of the good things in life. As you roll out the old truck in the morning, take another look at that load you're going to carry for the day. And remember this. Every time you deliver a case of Coca-Cola, 
You're giving 24 people a service that is worthwhile. You're providing them with the finest refreshment money can buy. You're giving them a chance to enjoy the most famous pause in the world. The pause that refreshes. <laughs>